just want to be right up to it as much as you okay. can. And if you have to pull away, just speak up a little bit more. You have okay. a, you have a loud let, enough yeah, voice, so let, you'll be okay, you're cool. all right. you were fine on the last time. Or, or let me know if I'm too loud. I'm not sensitive. No, just I can just turn it down. down. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. speak in your normal speaking voice, but cool. just you project a little bit. Gotcha. Then that way the microphone doesn't have to do all the work because it right. won't. Okay, let's try this again. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Hope you are doing well. Today, we are talking about the Battle of Hanover. Uh, It occurred on June 30th of 1863 um, in Hanover. Which makes sense. That's why they call it the Battle of Hanover. And sitting with us today is someone who, who you might have heard on uh, an Ask a Guide uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, he is uh, what I would say I would say the foremost expert on the Battle of Hanover. I don't know if he would agree with that, but um, he knows a lot about it. And let's see if he does. John Kreps, LBG. Hello, John. Hey, thank you, thank you. Uh, would you say you're the foremost expert? Or are you going to be modest on me here? That's that's a tough question right off the bat. Well, let me let me put it. Let me. I'm certainly, I, I've certainly spent a lot of years researching it and uh-huh. was able to uncover a lot of sources that were not publicly known before that point. Okay, <laughs> so, so and uh, I, I I can tell you that other guides when the Battle of Hanover comes up, they say John Kreps. Right. That's who you want to talk to. I I I will say that I think. Your, your assessment was fair as far as expertise in the Battle of Hanover. Uh-huh. I do not consider myself a cavalry expert. Interesting, okay. But I consider myself to be very knowledgeable on how troop movements occurred relating to that battle because I know the land and I know the roads oh, in the area. Okay, I know all right. The ground. <laughs> well, so then let's, let's, uh, let's get to that. The tr- you mentioned troop movements. Mm-hmm. Uh, before there's a fight at Hanover, they have to move to Hanover. Right. So why why Hanover? What what brought them to Hanover? Where did they come from? How did they bump into each other? Okay, uh, as I mentioned before the show, if if this goes too long, because I could spend a <laughs> yeah. lot of time talking about these troop movements, just interrupt okay. me. All right. Uh, it sounds like your listenership is very knowledgeable, so I'm going to kind of jump into the the middle of the campaign. Good for so to speak. Sure. Uh, as Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is headed northward, as the main body is headed northward, mainly through the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia into the Cumberland Valley of Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, initially, initially during the campaign, Lee is in communication with his cavalry forces under Major General Jeb Stewart. Mm-hmm. But that situation is going to change dramatically in late June. Uh, An idea is brought forth to Stewart's attention, and it's an idea he very much likes. Rather than have his cavalry move northward through the uh, Shenandoah Valley, Cumberland Valley, uh, and stay in communication with Lee's main body, why not move or at least some of his cavalry, they'll be moving northward, but they'll be to the east of the Blue Ridge. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it's I'm one thing. I if there's one thing I wish I could reword in my book, I, I'm not exactly sure who the first proponent of this idea was, but clearly one of the first proponents was uh, John Singleton Mosby. Okay, uh, Mosby believes that Stuart can take Stuart's cavalry force moving eastward of the Blue Ridge and pick their way between various Union Corps and then reunite and reestablish communications with Lee's main body upon reaching Pennsylvania. Let, let, let's pause real quick here right. on Mosby. Right. He's the colonel at the time? Lieutenant Colonel? What is he? I, I, I'm pretty sure Colonel, but I've but I'd, I'd, but I'd, he's I'd not a general. That. That, correct. Okay. Correct. He's a he's a he's in charge of a band of partisan rangers. Correct. Okay. Correct. He's not officially and correct me if I'm wrong on this. From what I understand, he's not a, actually a part of the Army of Northern Virginia. Correct. He's cooperating with them. You're right. So You're why right. the hell does he have anything to do with this? 
He mainly because he knows that area of Virginia like the back of his hand. Uh-huh. And he is also very country. close with exactly yes. it's Mosby country and Stewart has very highly they they have very high regard for each other. Cuz he used to be under Stewart, right? So um or not directly under, but he he wasn't always. They certainly worked with each other okay. on many occasions. I'll put it that way. Okay. In different campaigns, but and, but he was they, never a part they, of. They they were never his, as you mentioned, his partisan band was never officially part of the Army of Northern right. Virginia. Okay. So as but but they worked with each other enough that there's a great respect, and Stuart knows that Mosby knows that area of Virginia again like the back of his hand. So this, this idea of Stuart moving cavalry east of the Blue Ridge, it, like, like in, in our mindset today, looking back at the mistakes were made, mm-hmm. we often wonder, well, why would they do this? Actually, the idea has much merit. Mm-hmm. By moving east of the Blue Ridge, uh, Stuart can gather and seize supplies in an area that is not being covered by the main body of the Army of Northern Virginia. In essence, he can increase their footprint. Mm. Uh, He can cause a lot of confusion uh, in the Union High Command about the Confederate intentions during the campaign. Right. Cause a lot of hysteria in Washington, D.C. And he can also cut railway ties and communication lines between Washington, D.C. and the main body of the Union Army. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of potential strategic merits to this idea. So he's not just riding up north somewhere getting his name in the papers. No, no, correct, correct, correct. There are real valid reasons that that this, you know, has real good things that can be accomplished here for the Confederate side. Uh So upon hearing this idea, General Lee... He decides that he will allow Stuart, he will give Stuart the latitude to move Stuart's troops as Stuart sees fit. Okay. So this, I want to stress, and, and this is something you see a lot or hear a lot with, with first-time visitors to Gettysburg. They are shocked to learn that Lee gave his permission for this, this movement. Right. Uh, but he does. H- however... When you read the dispatches sent between Lee and Stewart, it is also apparent that Lee believes it is imperative that Stewart, upon arriving on northern soil, reestablishes communications with Lee as quickly as possible before a major engagement occurs. Sure. Uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say that if Lee had any inkling of how the extent that Stuart would be delayed, I don't think he would ever would have no, <laughs> assented I, I at would, all. I would imagine that's true. <laughs> you know, yeah. But, you know, things are going to go awry very quickly. So, um, uh, uh, oh, damn it. I had a question about Mosby again, just to go back to that real quick, but I can't remember it. So we're just going to uh, cut this part out. <laughs> all okay. Right. Uh, okay. So Stuart gets moving. So far, in the beginning, his ride's going pretty well, right? Well, actually, he oh. runs in. First off, uh, his, he's going to pick three brigades under his three most trusted brigade commanders. Oh, uh, that was the, that's what I wanted okay. to say, is, is he doesn't have his entire complement. Correct, right. correct. Okay. He selects the brigades under uh, General Wade Hampton, uh, General Fitzhugh Lee, and Colonel John Chambliss, Jr., Okay. And these are pretty heavy hitters. These are guys that, uh, you know, have very high reputations and deservedly so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, clearly he's picking his most trusted brigade commanders. Who doesn't he pick? He does not pick uh, Beverly Robertson. Mm-hmm. He does not pick Grumble Jones. Uh, and Jenkins' brigade will actually be operating in a different capacity. They will actually be spearheading Yule's Corps as Yule's Corps moves. So so ironically, the main body of Northern Virginia actually does have a much smaller cavalry screen in Jenkins' brigade Mm -hmm. with them, but... Because he can't... Stewart can't leave the mountain passes unguarded. Correct. Uh, So he picks uh, 
Grumble Jones and Beverly Robertson for that task. He doesn't um, like Grumble Jones too correct. much. Correct. In fact, I, like I, I believe it was Coddington in the Coddington book where he he states something to the effect that Grumble Jones and Stewart had a hatred for each other that was literally a pathological. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so it is clear that Stewart is picking men that not only he respects and highly regards, but he's not picking individuals that he's had a lot of friction. Right. With. <laughs> so is that also true for Beverly Robertson? And that Jenkins? I'm not sure. Okay. That I'm sure. Maybe some of your listeners would know that. I, I maybe don't they know. they weren't just right. his favorites. They, I mean, they weren't the best. Uh, they they that was if I'd have to double check myself on that. Uh, that was, I believe, a brigade that was brought into that specific theater fairly recently. That sounds right to and me. And I don't think Stuart had a lot of experience with mm. Beverly Robertson up to that point, but I'd, I'd want to double check myself on that. And then later in the campaign, mm -hmm. we hear the name Imboden, but right. he's not part of Stuart's- Correct, correct. He's not even, exactly. He's drawn into the campaign. Uh, he's not even part of the Army of Northern Virginia right. initially, but is drawn into the campaign later on, so to speak. Okay. So, so, the, so the, just in case people were waiting right. for you to say sure. in Bowdoin, I wanted to get that out there. Gotcha. Um, okay. So, all right. So now back to Stuart then. So we, he starts off his ride. Oh, oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. So basically during the darkness on the night of June 24th, 1863, the three brigades of Chambliss, uh, Hampton and Fitzhugh Lee will gather under the cover of darkness near Salem or Salem Depot, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And then in the very early morning of June 25th, still under the cover of darkness, they will begin their ride or expedition. Now, almost immediately things start to go wrong because in the very first day, Stuart, for lack of a better word, bumps into the Union Second Corps. Yeah. I think it was specifically Gibbon's division, but I, I'd, I'd have to double check on that. And a good portion of the Union Second Infantry Corps is using a road that Stuart had planned to utilize. So what he's finding out right away that is different from previous times he rode around the Union Army is that now the Union Army is on the move. Hmm. And it's going to be a, a whole different deal trying to get around troops that are on the move as opposed to troops that had in other campaigns been relatively stationary. I'm assuming he sends word back to Lee. Well, well, at this point, he has to make a decision without Lee's consultation uh. because he's already out of communication with Lee to a large degree. So at this point on June 25th, Stuart is faced with, now this is hindsight that I'm sure. saying, but in hindsight could be argued to be one of the largest decision, military decisions in U.S. military history. Now, he could at that point decide in his own to fall back into the Shenandoah Valley and essentially reestablish communications with Lee's main body. Uh, but Stuart decides on another choice. Since that particular road was blocked, he decides to go much further eastward <laughs> to try to get completely around the Union Army. So, so initially, this movement was intended to go in between various Union Corps. Now he's going to try to completely ride around the entire Union Army by going much further east. Mm. And in his assessment at the time, he believed he could still completely move around the Union Army of the Potomac and still reestablish communications with Lee on northern soil before a major engagement occurs. So but so Lee's army by the 25th is in Pennsylvania. A good, uh, yeah, I yes. mean, most of it, right? Y yes. Yeah, I mean, he's at this point, to, to give you, and, and, and also to, to think about it this way, on, on June the 28th, I'm going to jump ahead of myself a little bit to give you an idea of the extent of this, on June the 28th, when Stewart crosses the Potomac River from Virginia to Maryland on that morning, the leading elements of Lee's army are were literally within eyesight of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> and right. Rhodes Division's in Carlisle. Right. So, really so when you look at a map of that, 
the, the distances there are, if I think, again, if Lee had had any imagination that Stuart would be that far delayed, he would have put his foot down right away in the movement. Okay. So, all right. So that, that makes a little more sense right. then. And, and, and then, and then to kind of backtrack slightly. So Stuart crosses the Potomac at Rousers Ford, um, not too far from Rockville, Maryland. The crossing begins on the night of the 27th and extends into the morning of the 28th, also under cover of darkness. The mm-hmm. Potomac River was running pretty high at that time, so getting across the river there was quite an adventure. But then by the morning of the 28th, Stuart is on the Maryland side. So Okay. And so uh, so he gets in the Maryland side, and then he, he goes up. Now, where's the Union Army at this point? Is he, is he behind them now? Uh, th- this is an interesting thing. He he is to a degree, and th- this is something. And else, I want to. And again, it, it's easy to, in hindsight, to judge a lot of this. Sure, because we know but everything. Th- this is something that I think uh, Eric Wittenberg and J D. Petruzzi brought up very well in their book, "Plenty of Blame to Go Around." Mm-hmm. That it it actually makes sense in a way for Stewart not to be out in front of Lee's main body at this point because the Union Army of the Potomac, although they're moving on a parallel route, so to speak, with Lee, they're still south, south of, the, of They're still south of sure. them. So uh, there, there's a lot to be said from that angle, too. So I guess it is, it maybe Stewart's purpose is to shake the confidence of the Union Army from aggressively pursuing Lee to make them think, well, we got Stuart messing around back here. Maybe something else is up, or is, I, I, is it my I, overthinking? I think we can say that he, he, they certainly would like to confuse the Union High Command as to the Confederate intentions. Okay, uh, I, it, it could be. That's a good question. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if Stuart precisely thinks that he's going to slow down the Union Army. Of course. As we all know, in the early morning of June 28th, also, General George Meade finds out that he has been promoted to command of the Army of the Potomac, mm. which Stuart could not have known right. that immediately. Mm. So whether Stuart was where Stuart was trying to get in the mindset of General Hooker before that point is an interesting question. Mm. Mm. Um, but then also, I should mention before I forget, on June the 28th on the Maryland side, an event occurs that will still causes controversy to this day. A federal wagon train is moving from the general vicinity of Washington towards Frederick, Maryland, towards the main body of the Union Army. Mm -hmm. Stewart intercepts that supply train. Now, um, the Confederate attack and they burn some of the wagons, but they capture most of them. And if you read the accounts, there's varying accounts of exactly how many wagons they capture. I, I, I'm going to say approximately 125 to 150. Okay. Now, it might to, I'll, I'll say it this way, to a cavalryman, this actually seemed like a gold mine because most of these wagons were filled with oats. Mm. Now, the horses, and oftentimes people can think, think, well, they can just graze in the grass. Well, no, it's no. not that simple. No. They need protein from grains Fodder. to keep up their energy for the long marches. Yeah. So for a cavalry unit to capture dozens upon dozens, again, maybe 125 to 150 wagons, mostly filled with oats, this is like a gold mine. Sure. And Stuart decides to keep that wagon train rather than destroy it. And now from this point on, his movements are slower, are slower mm-hmm. because he's got the wagon train in tow and, and Stuart's actions suggest from that point on that he's trying to protect that wagon train as much as possible. And he's going to take these wagons with him all right. the way to when he gets back to Lee. Correct. So Correct. all the way up which to does. the Carlisle which, which, area, and which which he eventually does when he reestablishes communications yeah. with Lee. Well, yeah, that, then they do. That's what I'm saying. Yes. That's what I'm asking. Like he right. he's not he, sending them back to Virginia. Of course, at the time when Stuart captures these wagons, 
I don't think he could have imagined that a couple of days later he'd be near Carlisle. Right. Uh, but that's you know, yeah. But I'm saying like yeah, even, right, even right. as he's, he's like finding himself on the other side of the Union Army right, and cut right. off from Lee he, essentially, I think he still he's still he's, holding he on. He still believes that he can still reestablish communications with Lee um, before a major engagement occurs in northern soil. Right. Uh, this is something I think that's worth bringing up. Uh, you see throughout the campaign, infantry, cavalry, artillery, that the Confederate high command acts with great disdain towards the Union. It is almost like the Confederate high command believes they can move with complete impunity, and they're finding out that that's not the case at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their luck is starting to change. <laughs> yes, the yeah. Union Army is being much more capably led yeah. now at several levels. And you're encroaching on their turf. But exactly. Yeah, exactly. so they have more to exactly. fight for now. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot and different when you're a defender. a lot of pressure to, to move north, and he's doing it too. Okay, so, so go ahead. 28th, that's where we're at, right? right? Okay, yes. so now how do we get to uh, Hanover? Okay, first, real quick, on the 29th, Stuart continue, on the 28th, Stuart and the 29th, Stuart continues northward through Maryland, through villages like uh, Brookville, Cooksville, Sykesville, et cetera. Mm -hmm. On the 29th, late afternoon, the leading elements of Stuart's column reach Westminster, Maryland. There are two companies of Union Cavalry there, Company C and D of the 1st Delaware Cavalry. There is a skirmish at Westminster, which on the surface, on the surface, mind you, seems like nothing, but I suggest it is far more crucial for the number of troops involved because the, that why do you say it sounds like nothing the, the the reason is a lot of people think well okay so two companies of union cavalry are wiped out it seems like you know a small amount of casualties the confederates oh. barely suffer any casualties now what's interesting is that if these two companies of delaware cavalry had fled immediately upon stewart's approach stewart probably isn't delayed hardly at all. Mm -hmm. Or if they completely, let's say, pull an Alamo and stay in Westminster and fight to the last man, they'd probably be, they would have been overwhelmed immediately. And again, Stuart's probably not delayed. Okay. But they actually do both. They fight initially, uh -huh. and then those two companies, or what's left of them, flee southward along the road to Reicherstown in Baltimore from Westminster. Okay. And some of Stuart's men pursue them southward okay so once the dust settles from the engagement the skirmish at westminster instead of stewart potentially being in pennsylvania now the leading troops of his column are in the general area of westminster to union mills north of there so the leading elements are you know in camp Right, near Union right. Mills. Waiting for column, the guys that pursued. But his column is stretched out from Union Mills back to Westminster at that point. Gotcha. So okay. now instead he's... Who's got to wait for those right. guys that pursue. So I'm just suggesting that as small as that engagement seems for your listeners, if you get a chance, check out the walking tour in Westminster. It's mm. interesting. You'll see some buildings with bullet holes in from mm. it. And, and it, it's, again, it's a... It's a small scale skirmish that I think has a very great impact in the whole campaign. Well, um, a theme a theme that uh, you know often comes up if you you know think when you're reading about this right. stuff is time. Like right. time, Exa exactly. Time exactly. is a huge factor. Is, like I mean, Buford. Yes. What was Buford doing? He was buying right. time. Exactly. He didn't want to like defeat yes. them. He wanted to buy time. Right. And uh, so time again, right. like that, the time it took, even though it's small numbers, the time it took for those pursuers to finish what they were doing and mm -hmm. get back to Stuart, Stuart, I'm, I'm exactly. assuming you're saying that he w had to wait for them, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and then yeah, exactly. So Re uh, that's time. at that point yeah. and it takes time. Yeah. Uh, so on the night of June 29th to the morning of the 30th, Stuart's is encamped essentially from Westminster northward to Union Mills along the Baltimore Pike, okay. modern day Route 97. Uh, now in the meantime, the Union Army moving northward in pursuit of Lee's main body, uh, and it, I'm sure many of your listeners would know, there's 
at this point, the Army of the Potomac, three divisions of cavalry under Buford, David McMurtry, Gregg, and the one we're concerned with, uh, Brigadier General, or, or G- General, excuse me, U. Judson Kilpatrick. Mm-hmm. Now, Kilpatrick's division is somewhere between about 3,500 to 4,000 at this point. Uh, they are essentially in the center of the Union cavalry screen moving northward, even though Kilpatrick is new to division command. And in a sense, it's a newly minted division because uh, Kilpatrick is new to division command. The two uh, generals under him, Farnsworth and Custer, are recently promoted to general and new to brigade Brigade, command. And even though some of the regiments in that division have seen battle experience. Some are very green, and 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 it's a division. It's it's two brigades that it's a newly minted division again. In that, a lot of officers there are working with officers are not used to working with. Because that was Stahl's division, is that right? That's or how do you say it? The, the, I, I say Julius Stahl. Stahl. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That uh, basically. Um, and that wasn't part of the Army of the Potomac, was it? Correct, correct. Stalls, it, they were originally uh, part of the defenses of, of Washington. Washington. Uh, now, essentially, Kilpatrick is, again, trying to assimilate command of a new division here. He reaches Littlestown on the night of the 29th, Littlestown, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. And at that point, he hasn't even yet met all the regimental commanders in that division. He's that division is still because, like the the fifth and sixth Michigans, you know, they reach they reach Littlestown well after a lot of the other units in that division. Right. Um, so now the stage is now set for June thirtieth engagement of Hanover the next day. And and if you look at a map, if you can visualize a map. Or if you're, if you're, uh, some like, people read a, uh, what look at the Lano map along right. with us. So I'm on, I'm looking at page 76 just to get an idea yeah. of the area. And I'll use, uh, obviously. The, Go ahead. Uh, if you have Union Mills, if you, it, the, it's what I call the triangle of operations for the morning of June the 30th. Okay. You have <clears throat> Union Mills area of Maryland at the southern part of the triangle. Myersville also. Yes, yes. It's it's essentially the village was technically called Myersville, but the area was now called, it, it was often referred to as Union, it was Union Mills Post Office. Sure, okay, gotcha. Uh, and Littlestown, Pennsylvania, to the western part of the triangle, mm-hmm. and Hanover at the northern corner mm-hmm. of the triangle. Okay. And it is within that triangle of operations along that perimeter from between Union Mills, Littlestown, and Hanover that the movements and the action are going to occur the following day, June 30th. Now, on June 20, on the night of June 29th, Stuart finds out from scouts that there is a significant force of Union Cavalry at Littlestown, Pennsylvania, okay. in front of him. Now, I, I'm, I doubt that he knows it's Kilpatrick per se. Sure, right. But this is, this is important because up to this time of the campaign, Stuart has encountered small units of Union Cavalry, which he has easily brushed aside. But now his scouts report there's at least a few thousand Union Cavalry at Littlestown. And Stuart realizes that this is something that he's not just going to be able to brush push aside, aside, brush aside yeah. easily. So he decides the following morning that he's going to move through Hanover, and notice I say through Hanover, he's not intending to move to Hanover, but through it and continue northward through the Pigeon Hills and eventually to what what we'll call the Lincoln Highway or Route 30. So looking at your map here, Mm -hmm. um, so he leaves from Union Mills, right? right? And what's the road he takes to to Hanover? This is the old Hanover Westminster Road. Oh, it's Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, there there you go. Okay. And and then, and now, and what's going to happen is Chambliss and Hampton's brigade, along with the captured wagon train, will take 
the Hanover Westminster Road. That will be the main column. And is the Hanover Westminster Road still there today? Yes. And yes. what's it called today? We, still do, yeah, we just, we just okay. call it the Westminster Road. Okay, yeah, Westminster Hanover Road. and vice versa. Yeah. Yes. And now, if looking at this map, if Kilpatrick is at Littlestown, Oh, oh, but anyway, mm -hmm. what Stuart does not know, of course, when he plans to move through Hanover the next morning is that Kilpatrick is also headed through Hanover the following morning. Okay. So the stage is now set. But when you look at a map like that of that triangle of operations, well, it's easy to see who's going to get to Hanover first. Mm -hmm. It's, it's only Kilpatrick. about uh, maybe roughly seven miles roughly from Littlestown to Hanover that Kilpatrick has to traverse. Stuart has to travel at least 12 miles from Union Mills to Hanover. And the reason I say at least is that the leading brigade of Stuart's at that time and the night before at Union Mills was Fitz Lee. But Fitz Lee is not going to take the main column route along the Hanover Westminster Road. He's going to take back roads through the Triangle of Operation to screen Stewart's uh, column. Ah, uh, okay. So that means that Chambliss <clears throat> and Hampton, which had encamped or bivouacked, I should say, a little bit south of Union Mills, have even longer to okay. go than, than than twelve miles. Got it. Okay. So, and 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 what makes it worse is that while Kilpatrick's route from Littlestown to Hanover, Pennsylvania is relatively level, few grades, but nothing major. The Hanover Westminster Road that Stewart's main column is taking is like a roller coaster. Wow. It's one of those roads where today, if you drive in your car, you where you that literally feeling in your stomach. Heels, almost like you're on a roller coaster where your stomach, <laughs> yeah. where your belly goes up I love your that. <laughs> that. That's the way some of those hills are. Sure, okay. So, and then to add to the problem is that Cham Chambliss's brigade of about 1,300 Virginians is the leading brigade. Then next in the main column route is the captured wagon train, and Hampton's brigade is behind the captured wagon train. So that means that Chambliss's brigade uh, of about 1,300 men, which alone. is Stuart's smallest brigade, is headed toward an, an unknown engagement, so to speak, for which quick reinforcements are going to be impossible. Yeah, because um, of that stupid wagon train. Exactly. So, all right, so yes. l l obviously, uh, um, uh, what the hell's his name? Kilpatrick, Kilpatrick is going yes. to get there first, uh, right, right, uh, right, provided right, there's right. no problems along the way, which I'm assuming there weren't. Right, right, exactly. Okay, but, so, but the two roads, if you look at them on a map, mm -hmm. they, they're not parallel to each other. They're not going in opposite directions. They're, they're exactly. feeding into That's each right. other. Exactly. They're converging Converging, to a point that's the word I'm Hanover. looking for. You got it. Right, at Hanover. Uh, right. So um, when, how does the Battle of Hanover start? Does it start outside of Hanover? Because I, I always, well, I never okay. really looked into it before. Okay. And um, I always thought that it started with one coming in one end and one coming in the other end, but it's not. They're no, coming no, in the no, same no. end. They're coming in on routes that are converging and almost parallel at the top of the triangle. Yeah. What is um, the what is the uh, road that they meet on here? That that will be they will meet pretty close. The, 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 let's say not, not talking about any skirmishing of, right. of detachments. Well, I, I mean, I mean, really, they, well, I should the clarify battle that. Hanover will, will actually start at the intersection of the Westminster Road and. Little Frederick Town. Street, or, the, okay. or which is the Hanover Little. Oh, Frederick Road. Street. Okay, yeah. I was just Frederick there Street is that, is, and the Hanover Littlestown Road or Route One Ninety Four. I get so turned around in Hanover, I, I can't figure. Understood. <laughs> I, I yes, I hear that. A but lot. my doctor that's that I understood. went to today is on right. Frederick Street, so that's right where right. I was. Yeah. So essentially, and and I'll I'll kind of make this part quick. Uh, most of Kilpatrick's division, well. Okay, the, the 5th and 6th Michigan mm -hmm. of Custer's Brigade Custer's of Kilpatrick's Brigade. Division right. will remain in the general vicinity of Littlestown to do scouting while the rest of Kilpatrick's troops ride northward. So, leading Kilpatrick's column on the morning of the 30th from Littlestown to Hanover is the 1st and 7th Michigan also of Custer's Brigade. Okay. Now, the 1st and 7th Michigan, though, 
when they reach Hanover, maybe mid morning of the 30th, they they may stop for a short time, but they continue northward quickly out Route 194 Broadway or the Abbottstown Road, if you the will. Abbotstown Road. Okay, yeah. So when the first shots are fired at Hanover, the first and seventh Michigan are very close to Abbottstown, literally off the map we're looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, now, then after the first and seventh Michigan, here comes Farnsworth's Brigade of Kilpatrick's Division. Mm-hmm. And the first West Virginia Regiment, uh, the first Vermont, will move into Hanover, then followed by, and there will also be some artillery here that we can talk about too, but but also then there will be the 5th New York and the 18th Pennsylvania will be bringing up the rear mm-hmm. of Farnsworth's brigade. Now notice the 18th Pennsylvania technically isn't the rear of Patrick's whole division, right? because again, the 5th and 6th Michigan are still well south of there scouting on back roads. So. Okay, so then I, I guess I kind of did have an idea in that some right. t- troops, some Union troops did have to come back through the exactly, other end. Exactly, okay. they do, they do. Yeah. So essentially what's going to happen then, uh, as Farnsworth's brigade reaches um, Hanover mid-morning or so, they stay in Hanover, a lot of their troops dismount, and they're being fed and given drink by local citizens. It turns into a big party, Mm -hmm. literally. Uh, The local citizens are thrilled to see Union troops there. People are bringing them literally beer, pretzels. Well, you know, you can't go to Hanover without them beer and pretzels. (laughs) So, um, and all kinds of food. While that is happening, that party in the town, the leading elements of Stewart's column, Chambliss's brigade, are approaching along the Westminster Road. And the leading elements of Chambliss's brigade will strike the rear, the rear guard of the 18th Pennsylvania. Right. N- very near the intersection of the little Hanover Littlestown Road and the Hanover Westminster Road. So this is um, who is second North Carolina or the 13th? Virginia? This is actually 13th Virginia okay. at, at this point. Um, so the, so the 13th Virginia is coming in on the. Or are they coming in on the on the Littlestown Road like ahead of the rest of uh, Kilpatrick's division? Is that is that right? Because I'm, I'm looking at here on the Lano um, map, it looks like not not a. Let me see. See how uh, the 13th Virginia is here. Here's the 18th PA. So I'm assuming then that Custer's men are still down here. Is that what you were saying before? Yeah, yeah. The fifth and sixth Michigan, yes. The fifth, so, so uh, but right. they're still in back roads. They're off your map there at this point, uh-huh. and the first and seventh Michigan are off your map to the north at near Abbottstown. Up here, so, yes, yes. So, so actually, when we talk about the Battle of Hanover, for the most part, and, and I, I'm I'm really oversimplifying this, but as far as the main fighting in the town itself, for the most part, it's actually. Chambliss versus Farnsworth, hmm. even more so than Kilpatrick versus, versus Stewart. Stewart. Yeah, it's really Chambliss versus Farnsworth, at least at the beginning. At the beginning. At the beginning. Yes. Yes, and that will Stewart has because a close the, call the Michigan personally. the Michigan men of of George Armstrong's Custer's Brigade they will have their role to play also as this thing goes on, as will Fitz Lee's Brigade and Hampton's Brigade. But okay. uh, so uh, now. Uh, basically, at the beginning of the fight, you have a small rear guard of about 40 men of the 18th Pennsylvania under command of Second Lieutenant Henry Potter. If anybody watches MASH, <laughs> Henry Potter, it's really it's his name. Henry Potter, Second Lieutenant. He commands some about 40 men of companies L and M of the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry, and approaching. That they are approaching, as as that Pennsylvania rear guard is approaching the intersection of the Westminster Road and Frederick Street, or the Littlestown Road, if you will, mm-hmm. they spot the leading, the vanguard of Stewart's column, which is maybe about 50 to 60 or so men of the 13th Virginia. Okay. And when those two columns engage that will be the first shots of the engagement of Hanover proper, so to speak. So 
So I go, well, go ahead. I will, I'll leave it if you have any. No, no, no. I, go I, ahead. Let's okay. get, let's get so, to the battle. So, okay. Essentially, what, what happens here, when 2nd Lieutenant Potter, when his rear guard of about 40 Pennsylvanians are approaching that key intersection to the southwest of the town, mm-hmm. and they spot the 50 or 60 or so Virginians approaching from that intersection along the Westminster Road, the Virginians ride out into Frederick Street, the Hanover or the Hanover Littlestown Road, and they demand that the Pennsylvanians under Second Lieutenant Potter surrender. Okay. Well, what happens is Potter says, Okay, act as though you're surrendering now, but keep your get your rifles ready. And then as the Pennsylvanians approach the Virginians at that intersection, instead, the Pennsylvanians charge through those Virginians, hmm. racing up Frederick Street because they know the rest of their regiment is, is, up, there. is up there. Yes. That's where s- safety is, so okay. to speak. Okay, yeah. Uh, now, what's going to happen, so now we have about 40 Pennsylvanians being pursued by maybe 50 or 60 men of the 13th Virginia. When 2nd Lieutenant Potter's Pennsylvania rear guard reaches the remainder of their own regiment, they quickly wheel... Well, I I should mention, while this is happening and shots are fired to the southwest of town, uh, the, the main body of the 18th Pennsylvania and other Union troops in the town of Hanover, they hear the sound of gunfire. So... Mm members of the 18th Pennsylvania start to remount their horses and prepare their rifles Mm -hmm. so that when Potter's rear guard reaches the main body of the rest of their regiment, they then wheel, Potter's rear guard then wheels around and charges back at the Virginians with maybe about 150 other Pennsylvanians with them now. Okay. So now the flow of the fighting is heading towards heads right back towards that intersection of the Westminster Road and the Hanover Littlestown Road. Okay. And then in that general vicinity, it gets bogged down. Uh, the Pennsylvanians lose their momentum. And there's literally, in some cases, there's literally hand to hand fighting, some with sabers. Uh, Potter even claimed that with some of the men in the front of the column, it even turned out to be a fist fight. <laughs> uh, but now, so at this point, the Pennsylvanians have made it through this just this first very brief portion of the engagement, but their problems are just going to get started because shortly after that, the first main attack is going to by the Confederates is going to occur. The 13th Virginia and probably some members of the 9th Virginia who are now moving the, uh, northward along the Westminster Road then charge into that melee at the Frederick Street intersection. And in real quick order, the 13th Virginia, maybe approximately 300 men, along with probably some companies of the 9th Virginia, they begin to overwhelm those companies of the 18th Pennsylvania. Okay. Now the fighting flows back and forth towards Hanover again. Mm. Uh, so, so actually, so, apparently, some of the 18th Pennsylvania fled over open fields in the direction of McSherry's town, but most of the companies of the 18th Pennsylvania flee back towards Hanover once again. So the fighting has already gone back and forth along, you know, th- along the axis of the Hanover Littlestown Road a couple of times now. Okay. Now, at this point, Stewart himself was not right at the front of the column. But uh, one of Stewart's staff officers, Major John Eston Cook, says in his accounts that he, Cook, rode back to Stewart and reported to Stewart what was happening at this point. So apparently the, the initial impetus or the initial orders for this attack are coming from the regimental commanders and Chambliss, the brigade commander. Okay. Stuart, but now Stuart is made aware that there's there's an engagement up ahead. So Stuart now races northward along the Westminster Road to assess the situation. Now at this point, Stuart sees that there are Union troops blocking his intended path through Hanover, but he doesn't realize 
the the numbers of those troops and there's still a lot more you know north of hanover that will be rushing back in that direction real soon mm. and at this point what is happening is and this is probably about 10 o'clock or so in the morning the 13th virginia and some companies in the 9th are beginning to overwhelm the 18th pennsylvania and they are pushing union troops the whole way through the square or at least towards the square now stewart sees that his men have the momentum but there's still union troops through the town in, or in the town so what what stewart orders he orders a secondary supporting attack to be made by the second north carolina okay so even though the second north carolina is in chambliss's brigade their secondary attack is ordered by Stuart himself, even though Stuart did not order the initial attacks by the, the 13th Virginia and the 9th Virginia. So the 2nd North Carolina uh, was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Fitzhugh Payne, or I have that order, or just do, do it's WHF, yeah, Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Fitzhugh Payne. And what's going to happen here is that Payne would state in several accounts that Stewart orders him to make the secondary attack by taking a side street and striking the flank of the Union forces along Frederick Street. So, so uh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. so they're it's they're going like through this. the town. So, right. all right. So when I drive through Hanover today, and you know the old part of the town where all the old buildings are and everything like that, I'm trying to imagine this. I'm trying to imagine. <laughs> Fighting with horses, yeah, in the yeah. streets of a town, using alleys to flank. It's like, but what are you doing about the buildings? Like, how are you? What? What the hell is that like? It, I, I personally, I can't. I mean, even, obviously, even though I wrote about it, I can't imagine yeah, it. Right. Uh, uh, I literally can't imagine that. Um, init at, at initially, because isn't there like a the chase fighting down is an alleyway? restricted to the main street, Hanover or the Hanover Littlestown Road. And then to the north of that, what we call Abbottstown Street or Broadway, we call it Broadway now. Okay. It, but I stress initially, because once the con as as the confusion grows and the fighting begins to spread out, then you have individual soldiers fighting in all these little personal theaters of combat mm. in backyards, back alleys. So it quickly turns into a melee way beyond anything anyone had intended originally. Like, like just more yeah. like a gunfight, right? Yeah. Like just like, like a, a running like gunfight, and in some cases, a brawl with sword, you know, <laughs> hand to hand fighting swords. That's crazy. Um, so now on this, let me see if I can find my next map to show you. I just realized uh, when you're in the middle of doing this that I have a third camera here, and I, ah, I just cool. put it, pointed okay. it down. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen watching on YouTube, that I didn't think of that earlier. Okay. <laughs> so tax begin. Uh, now I do want to mention. On this one, this map called Major Attacks Begin, as Stuart's men are rushing into uh, Hanover and attacking, okay. notice, notice what's happening with the 5th New York. They, instead of, they don't flee. The 5th New York, commanded by Major John Hammond, will actually move off Broadway or Abbottstown Street, if you will, uh -huh. into the area north of the square, an open area we call the Hanover Commons. Uh -huh. And I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit here, but they will. The Fifth New York is going to use the Hanover Commons as a staging area gotcha. to counterattack. Okay. However, that that's just. I do want to jump ahead here. I think we have. I have one here for the. Uh, let's see. What was what, what the the commons? It looked like there was a is that a, like a rail yard there too? Looks like there's a... okay. I better use this one again. Th there was exactly there okay. was some warehouses, a rail. Yes, exactly. What is what is that today? There's still uh, warehouses there. It is there? now like warehouses, uh, some train tracks. Uh, I'm not sure what all business. A lot of it is, is that now, where the Royal Farms is. is? It's real close to there. Okay. It's real close to there, okay. but of a block or two away. A lot of the commons area now, I believe, is utilized by maintenance work 
for the Hanover borough. Ah, okay. Uh, but uh, yes. But, okay, I got you. Now, I, I should also note on this map here, these broken lines here actually represents an alleyway that runs parallel and just south of Frederick Street. Mm. And I feel pretty safe to say that it is that alleyway that was used by the second North Carolina as part of their flank attack. You know, that actually is the alleyway that I think it's the alleyway that I turned down to go to my doctor's it parking be, lot. This, that that alleyway, alley, by the way, now is called Exchange Place. Oh, yeah, that's it. It's yeah. A, yes. And it is literally right uh, who knew? on the back side of like the uh, Hanover, uh, the police department yeah. and some of the municipal buildings. Yeah. And now Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Payne would state that when they're making the second North Carolina is making the secondary flank attack as they are racing through what he termed this outside street, he could turn and see masses of Union troops still along Frederick Street. And he started begin to have the idea this might be a forlorn hope. He says that his the second North Carolina races approximately halfway through the town and somewhere point with this. Yes, yeah, somewhere, maybe in an alley, maybe Baltimore Street, but probably one of these alleys, they turn off Exchange Place, the outside street, and they strike the flank of the remainder of uh, the eighteenth Pennsylvania. Okay. So now what is left of the 18th Pennsylvania has another huge problem. They're now being struck in the rear by um, the 13th Virginia and elements of the 9th Virginia, and now they're also being struck in the flank by the 2nd North Carolina. So what happens at this point, the 18th Pennsylvania to a degree dissolves. A few companies of the 18th Pennsylvania will continue to fight, but a lot of that regiment will race headlong through the square and out past and uh, out along Broadway, Abbottstown Street here uh -huh. on the map. In fact, some of these troops of the 1st Vermont will even state that as they're moving slowly northward along Abbottstown Street, members of the 18th Pennsylvania literally fled right by them. Um, uh -huh. now, now, let's see here. Let me see if I can get, see where we're at. Now, at this point, the Confederates have captured the square. Uh, so this map I entitled Confederates Capture Hanover. Uh, the, I have a, there's this melee here, mm -hmm. still along Frederick Street. The leading elements of the Second North Carolina have pushed through the square and out Broadway, uh, slash Abbottstown Street. But now the 5th New York is going to start to make a counterattack and at this roughly the same time frame, elements of the first Vermont in particular, al along with the first West Virginia, will turn around and race back down Broadway. And now the shoe's essentially on the other foot. Right. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that in a cavalry attack, two things are essential cohesion and momentum. Uh -huh. At the start of this whole thing, Stuart's men have <clears throat> carried this out terrifically. They have cohesion, they had momentum at the beginning, but the further they go through the town, the more disorganized they become, they lose momentum and lose cohesion. And now when Union troops begin to counterattack, they, the Union troops will then have momentum, the momentum. and cohesion. Yeah. So and the second North Carolina's momentum is wearing out while exactly. fresh troops are coming on the field e exactly. or coming into the town. Exactly. Okay. And so at this point, then um, Major John Hammond of the Fifth New York orders his men after reforming in the ha open area of the Hanover Commons. They race back through a few side streets and alleys, strike Confederates in the square, and at about that same time elements of the first Vermont in particular, com particularly companies, I, b I believe it was companies D and M, not sure of the first Vermont. Oh yeah, I even have it there. There you go, there. Yeah. They, yeah. They are racing back and they will strike the leading elements of the second North Carolina. Um, and then they, the Union troops began to push the troops. Now, 
all this occurs probably in that part of probably in half hour or less. Mm-hmm. It's very quick. Very quick. Um, but obviously, there's a lot more that's going to be happening that we can talk about as we go along, if you'd like. Sure. You know, in the areas surrounding the town and particularly some of the Michigan troops, too. So, but did you now, did you have before we go any further, did you have any questions about any of No, no, that okay, seems okay. pretty straightforward there. Okay. Um, uh, what, so now does Stuart, I mean, I'm assuming the rest of Stuart's men are going to come up, right? <laughs> Eventually, yes, okay. but it's going to take some time because who, the capture, who gets more men up first? Um, I I would have to say at this particular, although as, as fluid as it is, I would have to say at the point of the that we're talking about right here. I mean, it's obviously the union, Kilpatrick, the union, yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, now, what's eventually going to happen is after the captured wagon train. Uh, moves in along the Hanover Westminster Road, that captured wagon train will go into park for a short time, literally south of the map here. Okay. And then Hampton's brigade coming up behind the captured wagon train will take s- some roads and eventually make their way, and, and I'll, I can show you this on another map, but they'll eventually make their way over to the right flank. Uh, oh, but but uh, I'm jumping ahead of something important there. As these Union troops race back into Hanover, they will then push Chambliss's brigade back out of the town, Uh back to the hills and ridges south of town along the axis of the Hanover-Westminster Road in that general area. Okay. So, and that's a fact. uh, But now there's still, there's still, um, the 5th and 6th Michigan are still coming up this way? They will be. Okay. They're, They're not. Not yet, but they is will Stuart, be before long. Is Stewart aware <laughs> that there's still Union troops over on his left? No, no. Okay. I, I, well, I can't imagine that he would be. All right. Um, he, he, you know, he may, he may suspect. I mean, Stewart, as smart as he, as intelligent officer as he was, he probably suspects that there's small detachments out there scouting on back roads, but he doesn't. I don't think he has any idea at this particular point we're talking about the havoc the 5th and 6th Michigan are going to cause and the threat they're going to cause when they do start to move towards Hanover. Okay. Um, but uh, so, but now, essentially then, let's see if I can find, okay, here's. I like this that you come yeah. in with, with maps. Well, yeah, I, 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 sh- I didn't even realize. <laughs> I, you, you guys are high tech here. <laughs> yeah, you guys, I didn't know you had. <laughs> so, um, here's Union forces regain control. Okay. And there's still some fighting in fields right, as Confederates right. fall back and even in back alleys and streets. And then, let's see, let's go to the next one. Hmm. Well, I still don't have... So they're basically okay. just clearing out the town. <clears throat> right, right, exactly. That that's that's what's happening here. A little like they're probably holdouts. about this is roughly maybe ten thirty in the morning or so. Uh, remember, I, I it's probably something I forgot completely to mention. Uh, after earlier that morning, when the first and seventh Michigan cavalry initially ride northward to the Abbottstown area. Kilpatrick goes with them. Right, right, right. So when the battle, when Kilpatrick hears the booming of artillery behind him, then Kilpatrick personally has to race back from the general area of Abbottstown to Hanover. Okay. Uh, At least one member of Kilpatrick's staff believed it was about a 20-minute race from where Kilpatrick started back. To, and then to reach Hanover was about 20 minutes. And that kind of fits right in because when Kilpatrick gets back to Hanover, the fighting is really starting to taper off. So it's the time frame, you know, maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour, the major combat is occurring in Hanover as Kilpatrick's racing southward back. and coming back to the action. And at now also the 1st and 7th Michigan are also racing okay. back to Hanover at this point. Now, where, where is... the 5th and 6th are... Right, so the, yeah. the, it's the 1st and 7th, 5th and 6th are Custer's Brigade. Yes, yes. And so there's and Custer's Brigade is completely split, split at that Split in half. Yes. Oh, no, does he have four or five? Yes, his four. His four, yes. so he's split first, in half. 5th, 6th, and 7th. 
Michigan. I'm assuming, is Custer back with the fifth and sixth? Where no, is he? No, Custer, this is interesting. Um, Custer mm-hmm. did move at least into Hanover that morning with the first and seventh at the beginning of his column. Okay. Now, this is where, this is where that gets a little interesting, too. Custer, is this when he tied his horse to the tree? <laughs> when when he yes at one point yeah. the mar- so it was in the morning when well that is probably in the afternoon oh, okay. after this is done after the battle's over um custer i'll say apparently also moved somewhat north along the abbotstown road to a certain point before racing back upon hearing the but it's hard to know exactly custer became so popular in hanover after the war that I swear every Hanover citizen wanted to say they saw Custer. The problem is the accounts of the civilians are just all over the place. So it's really- He was everywhere. Unless Custer is literally a Superman and he's everywhere, it's kind of hard. There's a lot of conflicting accounts, but it it appears that Custer at least, er, well before the engagement started, was north of the town headed okay. towards Abbottstown and that he also races back in the direction of Hanover. But if someone were tomorrow to come up to me and say, I have proof positive that Custer was right there in the town when the first shots were occurred, I probably couldn't argue with him. But I, I but again, I think the best evidence suggests that Custer was also north of the town when the first shots occurred and then races back. And at the time that all of this is maybe wrapping up or starting, you said about 10.30 or so, right? Roughly. Some, roughly yeah, 10.30, yeah, 11 it's, o'clock. It's hard. Even the accounts, the but times vary quite a bit. It's essentially the same time that Buford and Pettigrew are looking at each other. Uh, on June the th- like on June the 30th. On June 30th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah. But they're in his, I see what you're saying I'm there. just saying, I'm just like giving people right, an right, idea. Right, giving exactly what's <clears throat> going on in the bigger chessboard. Right. While, right, right. while every, because everybody's right. familiar with Pettigrew and all that stuff, right. but so while that's all going on, right. this is also happening. You, you got it. Mm-hmm. You got it. Okay. And in the meantime, David McMurtry, Greg's division, is still trying to cover the right and rear of, <laughs> of the whole Union Army yeah. at this point. <clears throat> so, all right. So then, all right, so then let's get more troops on the field then. What happens okay. next? Um, now, these, realize these maps, okay. They're, well, this is just the standoff here. At this point, Chambliss, I have Chambliss written in. His brigade has taken position on the hills south of uh, town. Okay. And... But Ham- in this particular map, Hampton has not yet reached the field. The- these positions are approximate. I okay. just have the four different. Um, <clears throat> what is the ba- who, who who are the battery? What, wh- well, okay, this is interesting. This is either Stuart on this expedition brought six artillery pieces that we know about. It is all or parts of the batteries of McGregor. And breathed, okay. And, and and actually, we can safely say because we actually have personal accounts of Breathed's battery. It was four guns of Breathed and two of McGregor. Okay. Now, now I cannot say with a hundred percent certainty which of those guns fired the very first artillery shots for Stuart. All right. Um, not important. You, well, it, it's uh, it's one at least one account mentions that Breathed's battery was, for lack of a better word, split, and that two of the guns with well, Breathed's battery were at the front of the column, and two were at the very rear of the column, mm. because because actually, a couple, uh, or not just a couple, several members of these artillery batteries get captured at Westminster, Maryland on the 30th when David McMurtry Gregg goes through. Oh. So, but at least a few of the guns, uh, I, I, if I had to make a, it, it, again, it, it, at this point, it's probably two guns of McGregor and two of Breathed. Okay. But their positions, so exact S- positions are Stewart only has six guns with him for this part, but there's more right. guns in his division, right? Uh, Right, right. This, this, those were the artillery I mean, pieces batteries. he decided to take just for, for this, this expedition. Purpose. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, 
it's also interesting, a little aside in that, uh, if you look at all the tablets on that relate to McGregor's battery, uh-huh. On the Gettysburg battlefield, it says McGregor's battery, uh, like out in East Calvary Field, it said that that battery had two uh, two Napoleons and two three-inch rifles. Mm-hmm. Now, the three-inch rifles were most likely the ones he took with him, the Hanover being lighter and more mo. But, but uh, Breathed and another officer in his own battery said that there was a Blakely rifle with them, oh. too. And that's not even mentioned in any of the tablets huh. here. That, but but they also mentioned that the Blakely, the elevating screw had been broken. Oh, <laughs> so it was. <laughs> so it was worthless. Yeah, it's, they, they said they could fire it, but it yeah. didn't. You know, could name it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but anyway, All so right. so now Chambliss has fallen back, and we have dismounted skirmishing taking place mm-hmm. between the hills and ridges south of town and the Union troops. Okay. And then I just made some conjectural skirmish. Sure, in yeah. There. So now- So the skirmish, so what are they getting into, like a stalemate kind of? Exactly, exactly. Right. That's the stalemate. And then here on this map, uh, th- this is much later in the day, I'm really jumping ahead in the story, but Hampton has now arrived and take pos- takes position along the axis of the Baltimore Road. Now, when I say the Baltimore Road this time, that's not the Baltimore Road that goes from Gettysburg right. south. Right. It's the Baltimore Road that goes from Hanover south. And then Hampton's <clears throat> brigade will eventually extend the Confederate position well to the east of town, even to the north of York Street. Okay. So, but All anyway. Right. All right. So, so then, so uh, it looks like, uh, let me see here. I'm trying to see. There's a little bit of a glare there. All right. So then, uh, so there's not a lot of movement, it looks like. Just kind at of this point, there, yeah. exactly. At this point, Stewart's path is blocked, and he realizes he's already realized at this point he's not going to be able to make his way through Hanover by using the Abbottstown Road. Right. So now he's going to have to make another. He's going to detour. try to get around. He's going to have to try to get around Kilpatrick at that point. Now you, we have uh, back here. Oh yes, it, um, you'll notice two batteries. The, the Michigan troops by this map time sequence have arrived. Right. Uh, here you have Elder's Battery, supported by the 1st Vermont. And here we have uh, Pennington's Battery, uh, Pennington's Battery to the west of Carlisle Street and Elder's Battery to the east of Carlisle Street mm-hmm. and with some of their supporting Michigan troops. Uh, but again, that's kind of jumped ahead of myself there because in the meantime, things have happened <laughs> south right. of town for those Michigan troops to get there. But the yeah. they're in support of the guns, basically, R- right, back right, here, and right. probably a reserve, too? Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Th- this is the area locals often have called Bunker, Bunker Hill, Hill. And this would be kind of like the Alamo last stand. Uh-huh. And if disaster occurs in front of you in the town and the Union troops have to fall back, they can make a stand there. It also becomes a staging area from which they can mount forays if they need to also. What are the um, civilians, because uh, you were saying before it was like a party, yeah. and then a battle yeah, they're, starts. Yeah, well, they basically shitting in their pants. Yeah, you know? okay. I mean, um, it, it, because one, even some of the accounts of the soldiers mentioned that when the first shots are fired, and then they could hear the sound of the rebel yell screaming louder and louder as the first Confederates attacked up Frederick Street. And they mentioned that the the whole reaction of the citizens changed drastically. I bet. Uh, and also, in the meantime, what was happening is a lot of the Union soldiers were trying to hustle, for lack of a better word, uh, hustle little kids off the streets mm. and into safety. Mm. Because we have accounts of men, particularly the 5th New York, that are literally lifting little children over fences and telling them to run right. as fast as you can uh. and, and or get in the houses. So... Uh, but but uh, but yeah, clearly the reaction of the civilians changes drastically. <laughs> Do they, are there any good civilian accounts that were left behind for the people uh, that like civilian stuff? There was at least one man who uh, a man in the Fifth New York said he saw a, a Hanover man with hair as white as snow 
come out onto his front porch with a double-barreled shotgun <laughs> shooting at the Confederates. Now, the John now, Burns keep, of keep, Hanover. Yes, keep in mind, he was shooting at the Confederates as the Confederates were retreating out oh. of the town. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this was, it, okay. Okay. discretion is the better part of valor in this case. I don't <laughs> think it'd be too wide to be shooting at the Confederates with a shotgun as they're charging towards, towards you. Towards you, no, that's not a good idea. So, um, <laughs> But you, you got it. So the, the, the Hanover John Burns. So we still don't know who he was. <laughs> right. But but well, uh, some white-haired but, man. but Kilpatrick even mentions in his official report that some of the citizens had quote volunteered the, the, to defend their homes after the Union men recaptured the town. Citizens and soldiers stacked up a lot of. Uh, what I want to say, structure, you know, benches or everything, you know, Just in the town. Uh, obstacles. Any, any obstacles yeah. to try to utilize for defense. Right. So. Like in the horse soldiers when they're uh, there, there in the station and there they just go. throw everything in the middle of the road. There you yeah. go. Exactly. Uh, okay. So where are we now? So let's move on so, then to. Yeah. But but anyway, th- that is the main, that is really the, the crux of the fighting that occurs in the town. Now, before that point, there's all there's some interesting to the southwest of town, all this off this map, as the 5th and 6th Michigan were moving towards the town, they encounter Fitz Lee's brigade mm. on, and along the Hanover Littlestown Road and in some of the back roads in the Triangle of Operations. Let me see if I can find, I don't know if I have that. Per- well, if this, I don't know if this will help you, but I think this is what you're talking about here. Um, is that in there, Eric? Can you see? Okay. Uh, so you're talking Fitz Lee's brigade, the fifth and sixth. I think these are them. Well, this okay. is at least the sixth, okay. right? Yeah. Let me get. And yeah, then yeah, Fitz they're, Lee. They're mo- right, right. So basically, um, what Fitz Lee is coming up the Westminster. No, he's coming up the Littlestown Road, isn't he? No, no, no. A, a road, Fitz a road Fitz that's Lee. between the two of them. That's yes. not on the map. Fitz Lee. Let me go back to that triangle of operations again. Yes. I think we should. On the triangle of operations, as Stewart's main column is moving up the Hanover Westminster Road, Fitz Lee utilizes a portion of the Baltimore Pike, and then somewhere while still in Maryland, they start taking back roads through the triangle of operations. Mm. So, and, so he's between Stewart's here. Yes. Fitz Lee is moving through here. Kilpatrick's here. The fifth and sixth. Yes. Kilpatrick has already reached. So what's happened? And as you was, said before, he's screening Stewart. The intention was that Fitz Lee would screen Stewart's main column. Right. The problem the Confederates had is that Kilpatrick's, the, the main body of Kilpatrick got past Fitz Lee's screen before the contact was made. Right. Now, but Fitz Lee's, as Fitz Lee's men are moving on these back roads, they will encounter men of the 5th and 6th Michigan, not only in back roads, but along the axis of the Hanover Littlestown Road. And that literally sets off an entire whole series of very small scale actions in the interior of the triangle. Uh, at this at this point, I've actually identified at least five separate actions above and beyond the main fighting oh, in the town that occur on, the on either on the way or in the interior of that triangle as Fitz Lee's guys encounter the 5th and 6th Michigan. Okay. So. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. So then by the time we get to the point we're talking about then. Right. Um, this is uh, where Kilpatrick's is the... Littlestown Road. Right. F- Fitz Lee is coming up somewhere in the middle here. Yes. And then this is the uh, Westminster Road. Yes. That, uh, yes. That, uh, so Fitz, uh, the, the, here they have him depicted as yeah. coming over this way. Well, so I'm guessing at some point he well, got up here. Oh, go ahead. You no, know, you got it. Oh, you okay. got it. What happened was almost as soon as Fitz, see, Stuart by this point has realized his way is blocked, uh-huh. but he still wants to protect the wagon train. So almost as soon as Fitz Lee arrives on the Confederate left flank, Fitz Lee is ordered to take control of the wagon train and begin the movement eastward away from Hanover while Cham- while Hampton and Chambliss are still in a blocking position. Right. So and then eventually later, Chambliss is going to leave. So okay, and so then later Hampton. 
All right, I get it. So Fitzley is trying to get on the road to get out. Right, exactly. With the wagon train. With the wagon train. Exactly. exactly. And then they're they're holding the attention of the Yankees. Exactly. And then eventually, and they're they're, they're holding the Yankees at bay. Our Chambliss and Hampton are still holding the Union forces at bay in case Kilpatrick has any ideas. Right. Uh, of making an attack. But then, as darkness begins to fall, Chambliss will make his way east, and 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 then, and then Hampton. Okay. So, all and right. and there's that's a whole different yeah. But I mean, there's all kinds of roads south of town that they utilize to make their, sure. Their, and they're not their, all their, depicted on these maps. No, no, no. I actually have. If you want to, I, I mean, I can show you maps of those too if you want. But that's yeah, we don't want to confuse everybody. Th- there you go. I just <laughs> understood. It's it's. We'll just assume that there's yeah there's roads in the middle there. Okay, so we're so then uh, is that basically the end? Th- that that's really the end of of yes of what's the, the story itself? about Stuart barely getting uh, away with his life? Oh, oh okay. Yes. Um, let's uh, let's look at uh, just to show you approximately where that happens uh, if you go into town to the southwest of Frederick Street by the uh, uh, Weinbrenner one of the around, brand right? it's, it, there is a Stewart Avenue and uh-huh. if you take Stewart Avenue south of Frederick Street you, you will reach a point where there's a little cul-de-sac called Stewart Circle and very near Stewart Circle and Stewart Avenue <laughs> is we believe where Stewart had to jump uh, a gully of the Plum Creek to uh, escape uh, some of the charging Union soldiers. And let's see, what, let's see. That well, at been, what point was that? That would have been, and here's where we're back to, where the Union forces regain control of the town itself and Confederates are falling back through the fields south of town and some falling back along the Westminster Road. Stewart is positioned somewhere in this general area here. Okay. Just a little bit to the east of where this branch of the Plum Creek crosses under the Westminster Road. Now, gotcha. that creek right now looks like nothing because it's all developed. Right. But even back, I can tell you when I was a little boy and a lot of this wasn't developed, there were st- stretches and branches of Plum Creek that were significant. I mean, we're talking maybe 20 feet wide okay. and three or four feet deep. Yeah, I used to catch some decent sized fish out of Plum Creek, and now now the creeks. It's you know, like a it's, it's like a just stream. Like a trickle. Yeah, it's yeah. right. Uh, it's, exactly. it's like a like a storm runoff, basically. Right. So my a friend of mine uh, lives out there, exactly. and he and he lives near there, and he's mm-hmm. like, "Oh, I'll show you where Stewart almost got." And it, it, but and it's I, somewhere we're in st- this general area here. Yeah, we're standing out there, and I go, "How hard is this to jump exactly, with a horse?" Exactly. And he goes, "No, it was bigger." If, but if you look, if you go to that area, like I said, like near where Stewart Circle and Stewart street or Stewart Avenue meet and look at that creek. You can actually see that although the creek is just a trickle, you can actually see where the banks originally were mm, many years ago. Okay. And it was So and so, it is true that it was bigger. This isn't just some kind of oh, lost yeah, cause yes. mythology. Because, because that, again, it okay. was even when I was a little kid, uh, uh, it was those creeks were sign- okay. those branches Very of public were significantly were bigger than they are now. Then we believe it. Yeah. And okay. and it was uh so but it was somewhere in that general area when on Russian Union troops almost capture Stuart and almost captures members of his staff, and they have to jump the creek. In fact, some of the staff officers, their horses didn't make it across, and they they fell in, and then but apparently still got away. Yeah, obviously. So, and then he himself falls back too. Okay. So, all right. So then Stuart gets away. Mm-hmm. The Battle of Hanover is over. Right. And. Uh, well, all the rest of it is not really the topic of this uh, discussion. There you go. Because like I said, we could <laughs> We just have to have you back yeah, on to talk about go. the rest can, of we it. We can do that because we can uh, talk about That's some really cool roads that we can follow. Yeah. yeah. No, it is It is interesting. Uh, and I don't really know a lot about it, so I do want to have you back on cool. to talk about it. Anything else you want to add? Um, just, uh, just the fact that, and, and I don't make any ridiculous claims about the engagement itself, uh, I just say that it was part of the tapestry of events, but it was an important link in the chain of events. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's worthy of our study. Uh, 
so that all these events in combination, yep. including the battle at Hanover, call Stewart to be significant delay, significantly delayed mm -hmm. so that he do, isn't able to reestablish communications with Lee until you know, well after the Battle of Gettysburg starts. It's a good idea and to go and do what he did, but then life gets in the way. Exactly. When you're making and, and, other plans. And then you have a situation at Gettysburg where not only does Lee, is his tr Lee's troops are approaching the battlefield with very incomplete information to begin with, but then you see throughout Gettysburg, Confederate infantry is forced to do jobs that would normally be done by Stuart's cavalry. Right. Imagine, the left. imagine the July 2nd attack against Culp's Hill mm. if the Stonewall Brigade had been involved in it mm -hmm. instead of being out to the east along the axis of the Hanover Road, right. east of Gettysburg, engaging in Union cavalry. Yes. Uh, if Stuart is on the field at, by that point, the Stonewall Brigade is going to be involved in the attack in the evening of Culp's Hill. Are you a little more forgiving of Stuart than uh, uh, than history likes, or at least I, popular I am, history I, but, is? But I tend to be, honestly, I tend to be more forgiving of almost all of them because they're, they're making decisions under pressures that we cannot imagine. Right. When they don't know what we know. Very incomplete information. Uh, and as I, um, I referenced the uh, Petruzzi and Eric Wittenberg book, Plenty. The title, plenty of blame to go around, uh -huh. yeah. and I think I think that title itself is where I stand. It's plenty of blame to go around. Sure, it wasn't. You know, I think it's fair to say that Stuart made some decisions that he regretted later, but it is also fair to say that a lot of things happened completely out of his control that could have never been foreseen either. Mm -hmm. So. Well, the one thing I think about when I think of Littlestown and Hanover is that they both have a Royal Farms, and Royal Farms has the best fried chicken oh, in the world. Okay, there you go. And I'm starving. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so that sounds like I think, a plan. I think I think we have we we okay. have everything. I think that was that was very interesting. Um, we we got to have you back on to talk cool. about more stuff regarding the, the, the Stewart's cavalry and everything. Cool. I know people want to talk about Stewart's ride. Right, um, right, you know, but uh, really anything else you want to talk about, John? Cool. Always welcome we to come that. on. I like talking to you. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Hey, you're and welcome. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank Appreciate you, ladies it. and gentlemen, for uh, tuning in. Thank you, uh, twenty five dollar a month patrons, for uh, your support. Uh, have a good one. There we go. <laughs> oh my. All righty. All right. Yeah, I'm kind of hungry myself. So like I said, boy, when you get me talking, I knew that was going <laughs> to... No, that was good. And I like that you brought the maps, because usually yeah, it's, that's... How did that look, Eric? 